Uh, if you would uh, turn in your Bibles uh, to page 996 in those blue pew Bibles and uh, rise, our second, uh, and stand with me for the reading of God's Word, uh, our second scripture reading this evening is going to be from 2 Timothy 3, uh, verses 14 through 17. The Apostle Paul wrote to his young pastoral apprentice, But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings. He's speaking here of the Old Testament, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. The Word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Uh, speak, O Lord, giving us ears to hear and hearts to believe. Encourage us, instruct us, warm our hearts to value your Word afresh tonight, and use this time to enlighten us and prepare us to serve you. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Um, if you want to go ahead and open up your red hymnals to page 876. So I've sort of got multiple props going on here tonight. And hopefully everyone grabbed this handout, some basic Bible study questions for yourself. Uh, this is just something for you to take with you. I'm going to talk about it just a little bit, but uh, it's something I actually used to give out when I was doing uh, rehab. So it's what I would give to alcoholics and drug addicts just to give them the most basic of how do I, what do I even do when I open the Bible? And so we're going to talk about that a little bit uh, tonight. Uh, but first, let me ask you a question. How do we know God? How do we know what God thinks? Uh, and people often say to me, especially when I was doing drug and alcohol rehab, but, but still, they'll say something like, I just wish God would speak to me. I mean, if he's really there, why didn't he just come out and talk to me? Why don't I just get a big voice in the sky? And, and they say, if I could just hear from God, I would believe. And some people are fully convinced that if only they could have that experience that they're asking for, they would be able to believe. But then they find convenient explanations for anything that happens. <laughs> and, and the fact is, if you want to know God tonight, or, or you just want to know him better, I intend to point you tonight to the instrument by which we know him better. Kent, I just picked it up. Uh, well, and we're going to talk about what God has put in place to meet that holy desire to know God. Right? I, I, do, I don't actually doubt that people mean what they say when they say, I want to believe, I want to know God. But there is something deeper about them that rejects the true God. Right? We have to make a, a distinction between wanting to know small g God and meeting the real God. Because what we find in the Word, uh, in, in the Bible, that reveals the true God often doesn't jive with who we wanted God to be. But uh, I've got to warn you. Jesus said that even if someone came back from the dead, people would find a way not to believe. And, and that happened, right? Jesus died and came back from the dead. right? When things happen, people find a way around it. Because God has actually done a lot of extraordinary things that people ask to see. God has done miracles. God has spoken in a big voice from the sky. And it got written down here so we could know it happened. And yet, people don't believe. And best we can tell and I'm speaking a little bit tongue-in-cheek, best we can tell, there is every reason to believe that every event recorded in the Bible ever happened. That, that's a tongue-in-cheek. We do believe that every event recorded in the Bible really happened. 
But if people are closed-minded and completely unwilling to even consider the idea that the Bible is a book of things that have really happened, and that and that the Bible contains real truth. If people, if a person will not listen to it, that person will not be able to connect with God. Now, don't shut down hope yet. I'm sure someone thought, yeah, I can think of someone. They, they just won't listen to the Bible. Now, not believing the Bible is not blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Because... Sometimes, people that didn't believe the Bible and railed against it for a long, long time come to believe it later. Oh, it's me, right? So, so the Holy Spirit does work. And so we can keep on working with people and communicating the Word to someone. Communicating the Bible to someone often starts with a witness outside of the Bible that then comes to the Bible later. That is, it starts with our own story of meeting Jesus. It starts with uh, thinking through, is there a God? And then comes to the Bible. So the Bible always comes into play. But sometimes the Holy Spirit does actually work in other ways to bring us to the Word. Now, some will respond, oh, preacher, you're just talking about an old book. Really? You're going to get your knowledge about God from this old, old book that's totally irrelevant for today? That's where you want to learn about God? Why should I trust some old book? Why would God choose to reveal himself in this ordinary and at times hard to understand and even uninteresting in places way? Well, something the Bible teaches us that, and and this breaks our our brains a little bit. The Bible teaches us is that God did not make us for the extraordinary. God did not make us to live out a life of miracles. In the beginning, before there was sin, God made us to tend gardens, to work, to love him and love one another in a fairly ordinary life. And part of redemption is not only Jesus paying for our sins and leading us to faith and repentance from sin, as Pastor Mike preached on last week, but part of redemption is also to begin to bring us to live godly lives, which means returning us to that ordinary life we were always meant to have. So in some ways, when you're walking in an ordinary Christian life, the lack of miracles is the norm. It means that, you know, nothing extraordinary is needing to happen to get you back on track. (laughs) And while there is still sin in our flesh, we do need various ways for God's grace to be mediated to us now. now. Now, that is first and foremost done through our mediator and great high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ. But there's also a number of ways that God, ordinary ways, that God has put into use for us to connect with him and know him, which brings us to the catechism question we ended with last week. Westminster Shorter Catechism, question number 88. Uh, So I'll ask the question, you respond. What are the outward and ordinary means whereby Christ communicateth to us the benefits of redemption? The outward and ordinary means whereby Christ communicateth to us the benefits of redemption are his ordinances, especially the word, sacraments, and prayer, all of which are made effectual to the elect for salvation. Now, another term that we sometimes use for these ordinary ways in which God communicates to us uh, his, the benefits of redemption, is the phrase, means of grace. Now, tonight, the only means of grace I'm really going to be dealing with is the Word of God, the Bible itself. Uh, and we will actually be looking at the sacraments and prayer in the weeks to come. So, um, to start with, we just need to talk about what 
is the Word of God. Now, for many of you, hopefully this will be uh, familiar, but for some of you it might not be. And for those of you who are familiar with it, I hope maybe I can give you some ways to talk about this that can be helpful when you're talking with people who say, why should I believe this old book? So, so this, is, this is almost another lecture in my apologetics and evangelism le le uh, lecture series. So sorry about that. That's just how it went down. So what is the Word of God? Well, it's the Bible. The Bible is a collection of 66 documents that include different genres of literature. It includes uh, histories, it uh, includes wise sayings, it includes a whole book of song lyrics, uh, and it includes letters written by various people to other people, just to name a few. There's actually some other, there's poetry, there's narrative, there's didactic, that means teaching type things. And when we read them, we have to figure that out. What genre am I reading? Uh, this is one of those funny things about uh, reading the Word of God is it comes to us in a literary format, which means we have to develop an understanding of literature, which can sound annoying at times, but it's part and parcel of getting to know the Lord. And Christians believe all of these 66 books, every bit of them, to be unique in that they are different from every other book ever written. Because they were inspired, that's the word we use, by God. Now, when I say inspired, that does not mean inspiring. The book of Judges is depressing. Uh, everyone did... Uh, no one, everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Oh, that's, that's like now sometimes, right? That's depressing. So inspired has to do with the origin of the Bible. That is, the Bible is, uh, the, the Greek word in the Second Timothy passage we just read is theophanoustos. That's a fun word, theophanoustos. God breathed. In fact, it's kind of funny we use the word inspired because it, it would be more right to say that it is expired. Uh, it has been breathed out by God. And the phrase we use in our circles to describe this inspiration or expiration, as the case may be, is the phrase, everyone hang on to your hats, plenary verbal inspiration. I'm going to explain each of, I've already explained the word inspiration, but I'm going to explain those first two words, okay? Plenary verbal inspiration. By this, we don't mean that God made puppets of people and just had them write his word, sort of word for word, as he guided their hand. And yet we do mean that every word of the Bible, in some way that's sort of mysterious, as the Holy Spirit worked in these chosen men as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit, that's uh, Second Peter, uh, through the personalities of the person's writing, mysteriously directed them, and therefore we can learn from and trust every word of the Bible, even the little details. Now, when we say every word, we do not mean every English word or every German word. Uh, the Bible was originally written in basically three different languages. Uh, most of the Old Testament was written in Hebrew, with a few parts of it being written in Aramaic. Uh, and the New Testament, as best we can tell, at least from what we have, was written in Greek. And so when we talk about plenary verbal inspiration, we are talking specifically about the autographs, that is, the original documents that the apostles themselves were writing on. And so we're not necessarily talking about our translations. In fact, R.C. Sproul goes to great lengths in his commentary on the Westminster Confession to talk about how idolatry of any particular translation, be it the ESV or the KJV, is sinful because both the ESV and the KJV have problems. 
and so we should not trust entirely in them. That's R.C. Sproul, so you can't say it's my fault. <laughs> but the Westminster Divines rightly wrote, because these original tongues are not known to all the people of God, who do have a right unto an interest in the scriptures, and are commanded in the fear of God to read and search them, therefore they are to be translated into the vulgar language. Not meaning cussing at people, but like the ordinary, we speak English, not French or Latin or whatever. And so they're to be translated into the common language of every nation unto which they come, that the word of God, dwelling plentifully in all, uh, they may worship him in an acceptable manner, and through patience and comfort of the scriptures may have hope. In other words, we actually have a duty to have scholars and pastors trained in the original Greek and Hebrew who can then translate the Bible into languages so that all that can read are able to read it for themselves, which itself we live in an extraordinary time, in an extraordinary place. I, I, there might be, and, and I wouldn't know about it because you haven't told me, I would be shocked if there is a single person in here that cannot read. Throughout most of history, people, only the wealthiest and most educated could read. Right? In fact, the rise of literacy in the last 2,000 years and especially in the last 500 years since the Reformation, has largely been due to the church wanting common people to read the Bible for themselves so that knuckleheads like me that get asked to preach don't mess people up, right? Um, and, and so, but nonetheless, throughout most of the last two millennia, most people could not read. And therefore, their only way to get access to the Word of God was to have someone else read it to them. And so it is certainly possible. Uh, I'm wanting to make a careful distinction, and, and let me tell you why. I worked with a whole bunch of guys that could not read. So this, this is a little bit personal to me. It is not possible to have a relationship with God without the Word of God, but it is possible to have a relationship with God without the daily reading of God's Word. Now, that's a dangerous thing to say. And I'm going to spend a lot of the back half of the sermon trying to convince you to read the Bible every day. But I do think it is important to point out that in some ways, prayer is actually even more primary, as is preaching. Because those two ways were always mostly guaranteed to the people of God. Whereas literacy was just not. Not everyone could read. Uh, but nonetheless, it has always been recognized by the church that the best way for us to develop our relationship with God is through regular reading or hearing of the Bible. And so our, the church has made a huge push that everyone be able to read specifically so they could read the Bible. Now, four other things are meant by plenary verbal inspiration. This is just a vocabulary of the doctrine of Scripture. So here, here you go, four words. The Scriptures have clarity, or perspicuity, but that's a less than clear word. Uh, sufficient, right? There's an irony here. The, the Bible has perspicuity, which means clarity. The, the, the irony of the word not being clear. So clarity, sufficiency, infallibility, and inerrancy. And each of these words has some qualifications that if you don't understand them can lead you to problematic places. But also if you don't believe these things about the scriptures, you will have no confidence in the Lord. So I want to tell you what each of these terms both means and does not mean for the health of our own souls and Bible reading. First, when we say the Bible is clear or perspicuous, we don't mean that every part of the Bible is just easily understandable. In fact, I've had people tell me, well, if you had the Holy Spirit, you'd just understand everything in the Bible. And those people need to read the Bible. 
Because in 2 Peter 3.16, Peter, talking about Paul's letters, says, you know, there's some things in Paul's letters that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction as they do the other scriptures. That's very interesting to me. People that are twisting the scriptures, people that are really preaching heresy or, or something wrong, tend to be appealing to the more obscure bits of scripture. And the Westminster Divines even had to address this, saying, all things in scripture are not alike plain in themselves, nor alike clear unto all. The infallible rule of interpretation of scripture is the scripture itself. And therefore, when there is a question about the true and full sense of any scripture, which is not manifold but one, meaning the whole Bible in, you know, interprets itself, uh, it all goes together, there's no contradictions, it must be searched and known by other places that speak more clearly. So first of all, just let me encourage you, if you've ever read the Bible and been confused, it doesn't mean you're not saved, okay? If you've ever been, if you've ever read the Bible and been confused, you're a normal person. So don't be discouraged. But rather, when we talk about the Bible being clear, here's what we do mean. We mean that any ordinary person that is able to read, can read an accurate translation and get the big picture, can get the important stuff, the save your soul stuff out of the Bible. Uh, and so it is important and that the Holy Spirit works through the Bible in order to work in our hearts uh, stronger faith as well as more and more knowledge of the Lord. This is often what we call the principle of sola scriptura, meaning the Bible alone is the final rule of all uh, rule of faith and doctrine. Uh, in fact, question number two. Let, let's all turn all the way back to question number two in the shorter catechism. This is, this is a freebie just for review. What rule hath God given to direct us how we may glorify and enjoy him? The word of God, which is contained in the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments, is the only rule to direct us how we may glorify and enjoy him. And what do the scriptures principally teach? The scriptures principally teach what man is to believe concerning God and what duty God requires of man. So there it is. We, we actually started here uh, talking about the fact that the scriptures can guide us uh, into all knowledge that we need. In fact, this is what we're talking about when we talk about the sufficiency of the Bible. Uh, that is, those things which are necessary to be known, believed, and observed for salvation, I'm quoting the Westminster Confession again, are so clearly propounded and opened in some place of scripture or other that not only the learned but the unlearned in a due use of ordinary means may attain unto a sufficient understanding of them. Now, so that's what sufficiency means. All right, so we, we said it's clear, everyone can understand them. It's sufficient, it has everything we need to know for salvation. What does sufficient not mean? Well, it means Deuteronomy is not about disease, Colossians isn't about cars, and Galatians isn't about gluten-free. I, I had to think about what went with those letters, okay? Be impressed, right? Um, so Deuteronomy doesn't tell us about disease, Colossians doesn't tell us how to build cars, and Galatians doesn't give us gluten-free recipes. That is, the Bible doesn't tell us everything we know to live life. It gives us all the moral principles necessary to live a righteous life, and it tells us all things God want, wants us to know. Not everything there is to know. Everything God wants us to know about his character and our salvation. But this does mean, friends, that when it comes to lots of things, we actually need to turn to general revelation. So, so if we were to... Uh, I prayed the back part of Psalm 19 in the pastoral prayer, but if we went to the front part uh, of Psalm 19, or if you went 
to Mike's Sunday School on Psalm 8 this morning, you heard how the Psalms themselves speak of the heavens declaring the glory of God. That is, the creation itself actually bears witness to and about the Lord. And so that's what disciplines like the sciences are for, right? We actually turn to the sciences for knowledge about things which the Bible doesn't speak to. Uh, but this also speaks to the infallibility of all of God's revelation. And by the way, infallibility applies not only to the Bible, but to general revelation. Meaning, both genera general revelation, God revealing himself in creation, and special revelation, the Bible, never contradict one another. And the reason I say this is important is because in our culture, there is often a dichotomy set up between faith and science. And good Bible-believing conservative doctrine says that should not be the case. If God's revealing himself is infallible, there is no conflict between true faith and true science. General revelation, rightly interpreted, will never contradict the Bible. And the Bible, uh, properly interpreted, will never contradict correct science. And anywhere there is a seeming contradiction, our interpretation of one or the other is wrong. Notice I did not say science is wrong. And notice I did not say the Bible is wrong. I said our interpretation of one or the other must be incorrect. But both special revelation and general revelation, both the Bible and the world, are infallible in that they reveal exactly what God intends to reveal about himself when rightly interpreted. And so any contradiction is our fault, not God's. And then... There is one last thing we need to point out about the Bible, and that is the Bible is also inerrant. Now, a lot of people are going to say something to the effect of, don't you know the Bible is an old book that has been altered? Didn't you read the Da Vinci Code where the Roman Catholic Church altered the whole Bible because Jesus actually had a daughter? If you haven't read the Da Vinci Code, it's a wild story. It's really entertaining. It's totally not true. Uh, but a lot of people are going to say, don't you know that it doesn't record real history and it can't be trusted? To which you can answer. And by the way, this will make people do a real double take. So you're telling me I can't trust the Bible that's been altered? That is a very uneducated, unenlightened thing to say. All right, I've done this to academics. I'll never forget. I was at a, this party. Uh, and I was talking to a New Testament scholar at OU, a guy with a PhD in Greek. I hadn't even been to seminary yet at this point. But he's talking about the Bible and why you can't trust the New Testament. And I looked at him and said, well, that's a very uneducated, unenlightened thing to say. And he just, I mean, he nearly fell over, right? Because he's supposed to be the Bible expert. But I don't have time to prove this to you tonight. That would be a whole series of lectures and a lot of things. But just let me tell you, the Bible has not been altered, okay? And the Bible does record real history. And we address those things on a regular basis around here. But the Bible can be trusted. None of you can see this, which somehow I did not think about when I chose to do this. But if you could magically see what I'm holding in my hand, this is a Greek New Testament. Pastor Mike and I had to learn Greek and Hebrew and all that stuff in seminary. And so this is the actual Bible as it was in the Greek. And down here at the bottom, there's all this gobbledygook that actually means something. And what it means is they have taken hundreds, even thousands of manuscripts of the Bible collected across time and geography and compared them. This is a discipline uh, often called textual criticism. Now, a lot of people, when they hear textual criticism, uh, they think it sounds like something that tears down the Bible. And I think that's what it was intended to do, but it has done exactly the opposite. 
It is textual criticism has only served to verify that we actually have a very, very good idea of what the autographs, that those original infallible documents I mentioned, said. And that the Bible has never been altered. And therefore, we can have all confidence in our Bibles. Um, now, there are, so I'm going to give you a caveat because they'll bring this up. So I'm telling you this in case you run in some of these circles I've run in, okay? They're going to say, well, but you know, there, some of those symbols mean that there are little changes. And you know what? It's okay to say, all right, uncle, you're right. There are some little changes. But they are pretty much misspelled words, misplaced commas, changed conjugations, and easily explained missing lines. In fact, even a few of the controversial things make no difference whatsoever. I'll give you a fun one. Since this has come up in the last couple of years since I've been here, it's low-hanging fruit to bring up again. The last line of the Lord's Prayer in the book of Matthew is not in some early manuscripts. And it is in others. But the, 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 uh, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever, amen. It's not in some early manuscripts. So, does that mean the Bible has been altered? Well, actually, there's a very easy explanation for that. First of all, it's just a quotation of 1 Chronicles 26. So it's literally just quoting the Bible, saying something completely biblical. And also, it's easy to explain. What more than like, now, there is, Pastor Michael disagree with me on this, but I'm preaching tonight, so. <laughs> I think there's an easy explanation for what happened. They, basically, the end of the Lord's Prayer was hard to make sense of liturgically. Uh, that means the way we do our liturgy. And so they needed a way to pray it together and have an amen at the end. And so they took 1 Chronicles 26 and said, hey, let's pray this utterly biblical prayer of David here at the end of the Lord's Prayer, and it makes a nice ending. And some you know, early monk that wasn't paying any attention copied that out of an ancient liturgy, and it wound up making it into a bunch of manuscripts. Or it could be that it was there the whole time, and some dope left it out because the light wasn't very good by candlelight. Either way, it does not matter. The Bible has not been altered. No doctrine has been changed. Uh, although in some places in Scripture, doubt remains over the precise spelling of some original text, no teaching of any significance depends on such a disputed text. And so anytime someone tells you the Bible's been altered, tell them, well, mistakes got made, but not any that matter. And that will, I'm sure they'll come up with lots of answers to that, but that's the truth. It's not been changed in any way that matters. Uh, and they were accidents, and it doesn't destroy the infallibility or the inerrancy of the Bible at all. It's just the complications of human life and a text being transmitted in dim caves by candlelight over the course of 2,000 years. But we have enough documentation to prove that there's nothing significant about it. So, uh, there, there you go. Now, we have two more questions that I'm going to cover fairly quickly. And I'm going to cover them quickly because uh, our elder Scott Levy, where'd Scott go? Oh, there he is, is basically going to spend the next two weeks, or more weeks, four weeks, covering the next two questions in Sunday school. And so I'm not going to steal his thunder too much. But that means to get the rest of the sermon, you have to go to Sunday school. So there, there's the application of this whole sermon. Go to Sunday school. Um, but let's just make a couple of quick observations. So we've talked about what the word is ad nauseum. Let's ask the question, what does the word do? Uh, and let's use Westminster Short Catechism number 89. How is the word made effectual to salvation? The Spirit of God maketh the reading, but especially the preaching of the word, an effectual means of convincing and converting sinners and of building them up in holiness and comfort through faith unto salvation. Or as B.B. Warfield put it, 
What Scripture says, God says. The Word is God's primary means that God has chosen to use to accomplish His will in the world, particularly when it is used by the Holy Spirit. Now, when I say His Word is what accomplishes things, that may seem odd at first, but think about Genesis 1. God spoke, and the world came into being. God said, let there be light, and there was light. God said, let the land come out of the waters, and the land came out of the waters. When Jesus, uh, Pastor Mike said this morning, when Jesus said, I am, people fell back from the power of the word. When it comes to God, what God says is what God does. And God speaking is God acting. And so when we read the Bible by faith and the Holy Spirit is working in it, or when we hear the Bible read and preached, which you'll notice even the divines emphasized, the Holy Spirit is actually at work. If you want to see God at work, read the Bible. I mean, it sounds utterly plain, but that's what it was, right? Because the Word is the way in which we access God. The apostles themselves were self-aware, were self-aware that the writings which they were writing was for the people coming after them. Right? In Ephesians, Paul said, all this stuff that I'm telling you about is built on the foundation of the, apostle, of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. And Peter said, what Paul wrote is Scripture. And Jesus said, if anyone does not receive the words that you apostles say or write, then I tell you it will be more bearable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah than for that town. For whoever receives the apostles receives me, and whoever receives me receives him who sent me. There's more of those hints of union with Christ I talked about a week ago. right? But it's this idea that the word of God is equate, and hearing the word of God is hearing God. And so what does it do? It works on us. It acts in us by the power of the Holy Spirit. So, what are we supposed to do with it then? Right, so I said God uses it. That's really the whole point. What are we supposed to do with it? Well, that is question 90. How is the word to be read and heard that it may become effectual to salvation? that the word may become effectual to salvation, we must attend thereunto with diligence, preparation, and prayer, receive it with faith and love, lay it up in our hearts, and practice it in our lives. Uh, And so we do these things, right? So we begin to attend to it. That means to study it, to look at it, to read it, We need to spend time with it. Now, one of the things I've said several times is that the word only works, so to speak, when it is correctly understood. So if someone is preaching wrong doctrine but still quoting the Bible, they're actually misusing the word of God. And in that sense, that preaching is not the word of God. And so I've I've given you all this handout that's just some real basic questions. And I want to point out two, uh, you can read all this for yourself, but I really just want to deal with the first two big words here in particular, illocution and perlocution. Right now, I've given you stuff here to turn this, to make it into prayer and to think about the passage, but when you are reading the Bible, you need to figure out what genre it is, and then you need to ask yourself, what did this mean to the people who first received this word. Uh, That is, what, what was Paul addressing in Galatians? What was Peter writing about to the churches in Asia? Who was receiving the book of Revelation? Right? So if you think the book of Revelation is a bunch of uh, images that are literalistic, uh, John seeing Apache helicopters, you become a dispensationalist. But if you understand 
that John was writing to a bunch of people that, you know, knew Greek mythology and, uh, and Old Testament stories the same way most of us uh, know Harry Potter and the story of the woman at the well, well, then you realize that they knew what to do with the imagery that John was using, with the vision he was given, right? I'm not denying he was given a vision by God. I'm not denying the reality of that vision. But I'm saying our interpretation of Revelation has to be informed by understanding where that imagery came from, uh, which means thinking about who it was that he was writing to. So once we understand what situation is being dealt with in the original context, only then are we able to take something and say, well, what does this mean for me? Right? Because if you read a Bible verse, if you read uh, Luke 2, uh, verse, no, oh, sorry, yeah, Luke 2, verse 14, no, Luke 4, verse 3, out of context, it says, bow down and worship me and I will give you all that your heart desires. You know who said that? The devil. Satan. Right? So, you actually have to read in the context and go, okay, this is not written to me. This is part of a story. And I need to understand this story. I need to understand, now it's a true story, I'm not denying it happened, but then we need to understand why was Luke telling this story to people? What did it tell people about Jesus? And only then are we able to realize what it means for us to do. And this takes a lot of practice and a lot of thought. And therefore, it's probably good to do a lot of preparation and prayer. You can take this uh, catechism, turn it into this prayer. O Lord, help us to attend to the word with diligence, preparation, and prayer. Work in our minds and hearts that we may always receive it with faith and love. Help our minds to memorize and lay it up in our hearts and give us wisdom to practice the word in our lives. All right, so those are all the sorts of things uh, you know, that we need to talk about and some of what uh, Scott is going to be talking about in uh, Sunday school. Now, a couple of things. Back to the sola scriptura idea that we talked about sort of near the beginning. When we say that sola scriptura, the Bible is the only rule of faith and life for the Christian, what we do not, and that we all need to be reading it in our own personal lives, what we do not mean is what Keith Matheson calls solo scriptura. It does not mean that as long as you go read your Bible in a corner every day and never talk to, you know, never ask someone that's educated about it, that you'll just know everything God has for you. Tradition informs interpretation. That's just true. We are Presbyterians. Now, we believe that Presbyterianism is true, but it then turns around and informs how we read the Bible. Uh, in seminary, we call that the hermeneutical spiral. That is, once you're reading the Bible a certain way, because of a tradition, whether you acknowledge it or not, it will then inform how you read the Bible, which in th then informs how you read the Bible. And so it does us good to read outside of our tradition and to ask others who are educated to help us think about the Scriptures, because we need to be humble enough to each of us say that we can misinterpret the Scriptures. And we also need to be confident enough to say that we can know things. And therefore, if we learn how to rightly read the Bible, we can actually have confidence we're reading it pretty well. So it's both and. There's a humility, but there's also a confidence. We can know what it's saying. Now, one other thing. And I only say this because uh, I actually talked with someone about it a few weeks ago uh, that's not here. But uh, we were talking about, what about if I don't, feel like reading the Bible? What, what if I don't feel like I understand what I read? Well, there's a lot of answers to that. It could be maybe you need to read something different. It could be maybe you need to try a different, you know, maybe you need to read with a group. 
Maybe just individual reading isn't for you right now. Maybe it's a season of life. But one thing we need to know is things are not true based on how we feel about them. Uh, and therefore, when we don't feel uh, pumped up to read the Bible, we should read it anyway and try and figure this stuff out. But let me try and motivate you to read the Bible. So th- here's my conclusion. Here's where I want to end. Uh, in John 1, the apostle wrote that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. He's talking about Jesus as the Word. I've been talking about the Word of God for uh, 35 minutes, 40 minutes, which means I need to stop. <laughs> and uh, the whole time we've been talking about the Bible. But the Bible says Jesus is the Word. Well, what's up with that? Is the Bible the Word? Or is Jesus the Word? Yes. Our most fundamental, <laughs> that's right. Our most fundamental reason for speaking of both Jesus and the Bible as the Word of God goes back to what I said earlier. The speech acts of God are related to Scripture and are the means by which Christ continues to present himself as knowable to the world. Scripture's words are word, not just because he sent them and speaks through them, but because his words are his actions, the present word actions of the word, right? And so as we encounter the words of Scripture, we are encountering the Son in action, right? We're seeing Jesus presenting himself to us, showing himself to us, and calling us to take up our cross and follow him. And so it would be weird if we didn't, if we held the Bible and Christ as separate from one another, and not called by the same phrase. When we read the Bible, right, and we read it with faith and love, trusting in it, and the Holy Spirit is at work in it, the Holy Spirit always has to be at work in it, there is something truly mystical happening there. And, and this is the image I have in my head, okay? This is just the image I have in my head, and it helps me, and I hope it helps you. When you get to know someone, do you get propositional details? Hi, I'm Wes. I'm male, 33. I have a job. I have a wife and five kids. You know, I, I mean, I can tell you details about myself ad nauseum. But does that mean you know me? No. It means you know about me. That's demographic data. But when you know someone, you spend time with them and you hear stories about their life that don't necessarily have a darn thing to do with you. Right? That's part of getting to know someone. It's just them telling their stories about their life. And so when we're reading the stories in the Bible and you're in the middle of Leviticus or First Chronicles going, I don't know what this has to do with me. Maybe it doesn't have anything to do with you. Maybe it's just God sharing stories about his eternal life with you and telling you about things he's done so you can see what all he's done, know him better, and see how amazing he is. It's kind of like sitting around, I know this sounds all millennial and hippie, but it's like sitting around the campfire with Jesus, sipping some coffee or whatever, and you're hearing Jesus speak to you. And, And I need to throw this in there, and that's every part of the Bible, not just the Gospels, not just the New Testament, the Old Testament and New Testament. When you're reading it, it's Jesus telling you about things that he and the Father and the Spirit, who are three persons but one God, have done. And you're just getting to know him better as you swap stories with him. Reading his word, hearing his sage advice, hearing the songs he loves and the Psalms, hearing about how he what he did with Job, and what Job had to say, and then pray. and saying, Lord, show me yourself. Enlighten my mind. Because that's what Jesus did. The Word became flesh to die for us so our sins could be forgiven. And he ascended again, sent his Holy Spirit, and gave us the Bible so 
that we have a way to be connected to our Savior. That's good news to help you believe better and enjoy more. Let's pray. Lord God, who has revealed yourself to us in flesh and word, we thank you for the Bible. We ask that you would inflame our hearts with passion to continue learning the Bible. Give us understanding of the eternal and unchanging truths of your word. Help us to attend to the word with diligence, preparation, and prayer. Work in our minds and hearts that we may always receive it with faith and love. Help our minds to memorize and lay it up in our hearts. And give us wisdom to practice the word in our lives. For the glory of your name. Amen.